There's no better place to be on Sunday morning than the ballpark, and Peacock is bringing the ballpark to you all summer long. MLB Sunday leadoff is here. Watch live games on Sunday mornings with no local blackout restrictions. With matchups like the Yankees versus the Reds, the Dodgers versus the Rays, the Mariners versus the Astros, and so much more. You don't want to miss a single Sunday. Sign up now at PeacockTV.com slash sports slash MLB. Streaming Sunday mornings exclusively on Peacock. Hey everybody, it's Sam Dykstra just jumping in here real quick before we start the show. Uh, Obviously... Normally, we come out on Fridays every week, and this week is no different on that. But this is a different Friday in baseball across all levels. It's June 2nd, uh, which you may know is Lou Gehrig Day. Uh, Across baseball, across sports, uh, it's the day in which we honor Lou Gehrig's legacy in talking about and raising awareness for ALS. Now, Lots of people beyond just Lou Gehrig in baseball have an ALS story. And unfortunately, that includes us at the MLB.com family. Uh, As you may or may not know, Sarah Lang's researcher, analyst extraordinaire who does work for MLB.com, MLB Network, ESPN, all down the line, uh, announced last fall that she is dealing with ALS, going through ALS, um, Sarah has been a trooper throughout the whole thing. If you follow her on Twitter, her Twitter account is S Langs on sports. You know, her catchphrase baseball is the best. She's always sharing interesting factoids about the game, celebrating the game, making the game, uh, as fun as it can be. I, I would call her the queen of baseball Twitter, but I think she's the president to be honest with you, because if we held an election tomorrow, she would sweep all 50 States. She would get votes from Every international country, too. Um, Sarah is just the best when it comes to the enjoyment of baseball. And she's been very active in sharing what her battle with ALS has been like, trying to raise awareness, trying to raise funds. Uh, I'm currently wearing the Roto Wear shirt that she's uh, that it was created in her honor that says baseball is the best and also end ALS. Um, Sarah has started the hashtag fist bumps for the number four. ALS. Uh, you can check out her pin tweet on her Twitter account. Again, that's S Langs on sports, helping to raise funds for ALS research and awareness. Um, but just wanted to bring that to you guys here on Lou Gehrig Day. Uh, if you're able, please consider donating uh, to help fund this research. Lou Gehrig's disease, as it's called by some people, ALS, as it's more commonly known, um, is unfortunately a disease without a cure right now um, would love to see that changed, you know, in honor of everybody who's ever gone through this, um, Sarah included. So if you're able, please donate to ALS or if you're not able, but you can help spread the message in other ways, that's just as good. Trust me. I know everybody's in different financial situations, but just talking about ALS, getting the message out there, retweeting some of Sarah's posts or some of the posts that are going around here on Lou Gehrig day. And also just, Beyond this, I mean, it's not just limited to one day on June 2nd. Uh, But before we started the show, just wanted to jump in with that message. And now, here's the show before the show. We kicked off this week's uh, Zoom call for the recording of the show before the show um, with me demanding that Sam show me the shirt that he's wearing because he looks very casual. He looks like a dad on a tropical vacation, and I I dig the vibe. And I uh, made a Dan Flash's joke, and Sam pointed out that he's not a huge I Think You Should Leave fan. And so this is the final episode of the show before the show podcast. <laughs> we're, we're, we're breaking it's it up. to this. Yeah, well, Sam said he bought this shirt. Which is uh, you know a little bit tropical. It's beige with some tropical pattern on the right side. He said he bought it at a thrift store in, in Sam's Florida. Rolling his eyes. No, 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 no. No, I bought it in a thrift store in Brooklyn to bring with me to Florida. <laughs> oh well, either Excuse way, use us, Sam. Either way, it's a dead man shirt that is now yours. <laughs> <laughs> you know he's not wrong it does listen, listen it does look very much like a like a like frank, someone died in it like a frank costanza on a day on the bocce courts at del boca vista shirt 
or like and I know that they Soprano. didn't live there, but they were going to move there. It, it kind of looks like a Tony Soprano shirt. A well. little bit. Yeah. Good, I like it, it actually. Look, Sam, yeah, I like it. Yeah, that's, that's, that's what we're that's not ripping on you. <laughs> you're wearing. It's a good look for you. I like it on you. Yeah. What does that say? I'm going to go home and soul search and, and then, also just like closet search and just burn everything up. Because <laughs> I was actually <laughs> making that my vibe as I approached my mid 30s. I was just like, I'm going to lean into this, you know, the beach burning life. things. Yes, burning. <laughs> That's going to be your vibe now. <laughs> See, Sam's going through a big phase of uh, pyromania. Yeah. Just, you know, throwing stuff in the backyard and seeing what, what's most flammable. Just That's like that... staring deeply into it, learning about your soul. I think I like that idea. Ben then offered, Ben said, you need to see my shirt as well. Ben's just wearing a very classic black button down. And that looks good too. Uh, you know, two styling cats. On yeah, the show it's, it's a little more gray than black, but yeah. Okay. Very- it's a charcoal classic charcoals as definitely i put it okay. and tyler you're just like in a plain white t-shirt but it might I'm, in a, I'm in a shirt that has uh here i'll show you it has generations of the uh oh it's blurred out the mexico city uh the diablos rojos uh hats hat designs it's it's a new era shirt it has four diablos rojos hat designs from their oldest eras up through current and i dig it i dig it I feel like that's a a one of one. Like you're the only person who has that shirt. Sometimes I do wonder to myself, like I'll wear some random, you know, world baseball classic thing that I got, or like just, you know, a hat from somewhere. And I'm like, I wonder who the closest human being who also owns this to me is right now geographically. And I mean, like, is there one other weirdo who owns X in, uh, you know, in a 500 mile radius or is it just me? I feel like I've got a lot of that weird one-off nerdy i mean you're wearing a wbc hat as we speak i am new zealand today new zealand got the, got the new zealand on today um yeah i also it's... feel like that's a good way of putting it it was like where's the closest person who has that shirt like maybe that's right. very popular in mexico city yeah exactly like, it, it could be there are cool designs i but... did get it at the uh at the team store at uh estadio alfredo harpelu um it's like one side you know Whenever you go overseas or you go to another country, they are normal sized human beings. And here we're all tubs of goo like I am. So it's like, I'm pretty sure this is like a 2X and it like barely fits. Um, One time when I was in Taiwan, I bought a hoodie and they asked if I wanted an extra large or a 2X. And I was like, extra large is fine. And everything fits well, except for the sleeves. And the sleeves are like three inches too short. So I have to remind myself when I go anywhere, like, no, you got to get the next size up because you're a big gangly out of shape American very it's humbling. just the super size culture we live in exactly we just need some positive self-talk around here <laughs> i know we do well we like sam's shirt he doesn't seem to believe us <laughs> yeah it's true we started with positive self-talk <laughs> well welcome <laughs> into this episode of the show for the show the official podcast of minor league baseball in case you could not tell this is a minor league baseball podcast my name is tyler mon sam dykstra and benjamin hill my trusty cohorts uh as we ride again on another week's episode of the show before the show uh, you can get in touch with us podcast at milb.com you can find us also on social media at ben's biz at sam dykster milb at tyler mon and uh we have no time to waste despite the fact that we have done nothing but exclusively waste time to kick off this week's episode of the show before the show uh we're diving in straight out of the gates into a promo uh that has taken the baseball social media world by storm. If you did not know, today would be Walt Whitman's 204th birthday. And I got to tell you, he looks great still in the pictures that I'm seeing. Uh, Walt Whitman, the American uh, legendary essayist and writer and journalist and poet and uh, one of the voices of America, a guy who was quoted in the opening scene of Bull Durham, uh, and he's being honored by a minor league baseball team, which is something that I love. Uh, Ben, take us away with this story. We don't have a lot of details on what exactly this promo is going to involve as of yet. Uh, but it seems like it's going to be a lot of fun and it's gotten people, I would say, surprisingly fired up, uh, on the internet. Well, I think the internet loves randomness, which, um, we all know very well. And, uh, I'm not sure how much the Lake County captains have planned with this. And the only reason they have a Walt Whitman promotion is because, oh, captain, my captain are just two that that starting phrase of a poem. I don't even know if that's the beginning of the poem. You know, that's how little I know about Walt Whitman. But, oh, captain, my captain is such a a iconic line. And they're the Lake County captains. 
So um, that's just really what they're doing. And yes, thank you. Sam just pulled it up. It's called Oh Captain, My Captain. And the first two, two lines are Oh Captain, My Captain. And so they're the Lake County captains and Oh Captain, My Captain. You know, that's the most uh, iconic bit of verse associated with Captain C, captainship. And uh, so they said, we got to honor what women, and I love this phrasing, and I've laughed at it in other contexts through the years, on what would be his 204th birthday. I love when it starts to get to that level. Just like, missed it. Yeah, like on what would be his 114th birthday. Ah, yes, if he was the oldest man in the world, uh, what a loss, you know, that kind of thing. But we know what women is dead because Homer Simpson thought um, that his mother was buried in a grave that turned out to be Walt Whitman's grave. Right. Right. And I think that like so many things in life, it was either Mad Magazine or The Simpsons. That's my initial cultural reference <laughs> is that Walt Whitman is buried where Homer was led to believe his mother was buried, but his mother was still alive. Walt Whitman is not still alive, but that's Wait, a great. It's kind of funny because as you said, it is like, well, it would be his 204th birthday. He's been dead almost two times as long as he was alive. He lived till 72 and he's been dead for 131 years. <laughs> So it's been, eh, it's been a little while. Do you guys know who the captain was in Oh Captain, My Captain? Derek Jeter. Yes, that's. No, this I, this one I actually do know. Somehow I didn't know much about this poem, but this is uh, Abraham Lincoln. That is correct. Ah, fascinating American literature Five points to Ben. Yes. On this show. Um, this is, I'm, I'm very intrigued to see how this plays out because uh, the, the captain's tweet, the Lake County captain's tweet about this says, feel the rhythm of Whitman's verse come alive as our captains swing their bats and slide into bases. Experience the joy, the unity, and the camaraderie that both poetry and baseball bring, merging into a symphony of celebration. So I don't know if that means like the PA announcements are going to be in verse uh, will they be doing, you know, tributes to individual leaves of grass, uh, on the field at Lake County? I don't know what the, what the actual manifestation of this promo is going to be. Yeah, it's a mystery right now, but, um, this promo today, yeah. today and, uh, on that, Wednesday when we're recording, on Wednesday when we're recording May 31st. So right. it will already be in the past by the time this podcast drops. And, um, you know, but the reason it went viral is just a Twitter user just tweeted, Single A baseball is so sick. And it was a screen grab of the captain's Walt Whitman night. And that's it. And that <laughs> I has love like, the description of it being so sick. Right. When it's Walt Whitman night. <laughs> but that tweet has more likes than anything I've ever put out into the world. And um, this is a man who just issued his 50,000th tweet. And this dude saying, you know, minor league baseball or single A baseball is so sick. That's all it takes. Um <laughs> You know, just speak in the parlance of the times and find something weird and you never know what could happen. And uh, but this, I will say, is a, is a broader indication of the Lake County captain's newfound uh, irreverent promotional spirit. When I first started covering minor league baseball, low these many years ago, um, the captains were always one of my go to teams. And I would just say for whatever reason, over the last five, six, seven years, they it just didn't seem like they had that mojo anymore, but they're under new ownership now. Alan Miller, um, the primary owner we had on the podcast several months back, uh, you know, he comes from a background with, you know, summer collegiate and independent ball. So a little more like seat of the pants, risk taking style. And, you know, they brought that to minor league baseball. So there's been uh, a lot of kind of boundary pushing or just plain absurd stuff going on at the ballpark. And I hope to visit later this summer. That's on my tentative plans because uh, I want to experience the teams that are doing weird stuff. I say that all the time. And uh, we'll report back next week on uh, any details we can glean on on Walt Whitman night, a poetic night in East Lake, Ohio. I just hope that nothing they do tonight rhymes. I, I got in, I don't, I don't want to say fights, but like discussions with a friend of mine in high school. And I used to tell him like, Walt Whitman is a great poet. And he's like, no, he's not. He doesn't rhyme. Like, that's the one job you have. And I was like, no, that's not the one job you have. He's just like, it's just boring. I don't get it. And I was like, okay, well, so we used to have debates on like Robert Frost versus Walt Whitman. Interesting. That's the, the kind of man. childhood Sam had. This is going to say, is those are a lot more that. intellectual debates than I had. Yeah, I was arguing over who my favorite Beastie Boy was. And Sam is like, oh, the poetic style of Walt Whitman, I believe, is far greater than those who reduce themselves to the mere trifle Trimble. of a rhyme. <laughs> Why would you put yourself into a box is all I'm saying. <laughs> you don't need structure. There's enough structure in this world. By the way, um, apparently the quotes 
in Bull Durham are actually like hybrid, like misquotes of what Walt Whitman actually said. They get at the general tenor of what he said, but apparently Annie Savoy's quotes were like picked a little bit from here, a little bit from there from Walt Which Whitman. Which also speaks to her up. character. Right. All, you know? There was somebody who responded uh, to the late Cali captain's tweet and said he sort of pitches for the Cosmic All-Stars, which is a fantastic deep cut Bull Durham reference. Nice work by that person on Twitter.com. Um, well, by the time you're hearing this, this promo is already in the past, but uh, you can go check out uh, the <laughs> the stories from the Lake County captains as to how exactly they honored Walt Whitman and Walt. Big happy birthday to you. Hope you're enjoying it wherever you are. Uh, let's move along, Ben. There is so much good stuff up on the sites right now. We've been talking about your road trip and stuff that you've been putting up. Uh, but I know in the latest edition of the Ben's Biz Beat, the newsletter, you kind of pointed out some of the other stuff that you've really been enjoying from our writers and our site. Uh, give us some of the highlights. Yeah, I mean, uh, I still have more to come from my Pacific Northwest trip. And this Saturday, June 3rd, uh, I'll be in Hudson Valley seeing the Renegades uh, as they suit up as the Cider Donuts. And we talked about that last week, but you know, looking forward to that. Um, but a really good thing about this year on MILB.com is a lot of the, our writers, you know, a lot of them work in the night shift, um, you know, are incorporating um, you know, more off-field or what makes minor league baseball fun articles into their coverage. So in the newsletter, and I think I'll try to do this as much as I can going forward, you know, highlight the work of other people and uh, that kind of material in general. So the Ben's Bisbee newsletter for, if you want to subscribe, you always say subscribe. I'll say this, go to MILB.com. Then you'll see like the top navigation scores, schedule, standing stats, team news, and then a dot, 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 a mysterious ellipse. Click on the ellipse or hover over it and you'll see newsletters and then subscribe that. So hover over the ellipse. On it. Anyway, among the articles I highlight, in this week's episode or this week's edition of the Ben's Biz Beat newsletter. Um, well, there's a lot of them. I can't remember if we talked about this before. We probably mentioned it, but the uh, Steph Sheehan, 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 Sheehan Steph Sheehan um, wrote about the Springfield Cardinals who had never done an alternate identity, a pretty conservative organization, you know, being there in Springfield, Missouri, um, you know, always popular because people there are Cardinals fans, but they decided to finally do an alternate identity the cashew chickens. And that's because cashew chicken was invented 60 years ago in Springfield. So if you want to read about cashew chickens and why the Springfield Cardinals finally, uh, you know, broke the seal on doing alternate identities with the cashew chickens, you can check that out. And that's a, to me, one of the best, um, you know, food identities of this season, because I've, I've always said my criteria for best is off, often just learning about something that I did not know about a specific region and uh, Springfield being home of Cashew chicken is it definitely fits that bill. Um, what else do we have? Um, well, another one from Steph, uh, the Fayetteville Woodpeckers. Fayetteville is home to Fort Bragg, which I believe is being renamed in the very near future. It's going to take a long time for people to stop reflexively saying Fort Bragg. Which that I is true is because the... Fort Bragg uh, was named after a Confederate general. I just so read about in uh, this story in this book that i've been reading about ulysses s grant for like five months it's going to be renamed fort liberty uh by the end of the year well there you have it fort bragg soon to be fort liberty is located in uh fayetteville i believe it's the largest military installation in the entire united states and you know headquartered there among many other military you know groups who are based out of there is the 82nd airborne division so the fayetteville woodpeckers played as the fayetteville 80 deuces uh, to honor the 82nd Airborne and really cool uh, logo with that. The hat logo is a parachuting devil. Um, so that's, a, I think, just like a really cool looking logo and, uh, you know, one of the better ones out there in terms of alternate identities. We have um, a ongoing series called Draft Picks, which is dedicated to focusing on individual minor league team beers, you know, because there's dozens of them out there. I, I wrote a roundup years ago, which is at this point, I'm sure, woefully incomplete. So we've been doing standalone articles on minor league baseball team beer. And Brendan Sampson has won on Spokane's team beer, which is the Red Band Tangerine Wheat. And that's part of the team, the Spokane Indians. Um, Red Band Rally campaign, which pays homage to the uh, Red Band Rainbow Trout. So now the Spokane Indians have their own Rainbow Trout themed beer. And uh, 
there's a lot more coming where there's a lot more coming. Uh, wait, there's a lot more coming where that's from in terms of there's my, a lot, there's a lot more where that came. From. Yeah. Where that came from. Jeez. Jeez. Talk about Walt Whitman and <laughs> masters of the English language. And I can't even put a sentence together. Um, there's also a really fun article um, of recent vintage, just kind of rounding up animals on the field over the last decade or so. And, you know, we've talked about a lot of these individually. Um, you know, we did a segment on when, when there was a bear at McCormick Field and uh, home of the Asheville tourists. Uh, but, you know, an alligator at a Charlotte Stone Crabs game, of course, Brett Phillips chasing the possum. But, you know, great roundup of all these different animals on the field. Uh, so there's point being, there's just a lot of stuff on MILB.com that I might not necessarily be talking about right now or writing about, especially when I'm so road trip focused, but it's there on the website. And I, I think it's really great that we have um, a more robust approach to it this season in terms of getting out, you know, stuff of that nature. Um, and there's more where that came from. I have even more on this list, but I could go on and on, but I would just say, if you're not already, just make MILB.com part of your regular uh, internet diet and uh, keep an eye out for stories. Of course, if you're interested in on-field stuff, and I know a lot of people are, of course, absorb, digest, savor, all of that. But uh, as we all know, minor league baseball is a double-edged sword, a dual-headed beast, and uh, we want to give both heads of the beast uh, ample coverage and uh, attention and love. I dig it. Very poetic on a day in which we talked about yeah, I tried to rebound there. It was, it was rough <laughs> going. The there. metaphor switched about <laughs> halfway through the sentence, but we got there. Hey, I know. I'm, I'm not. I'm no Sam Dykstra. <laughs> we don't all have that uh, the the cranial capacity of one Sam Dykstra. No, that je ne sais quoi. <laughs> what does that mean? All right. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Ben. Well, you guys uh, got a chance to talk with somebody from one of truly and probably. Um, very under the, the radar, Lee, uh, a very historic baseball community in America. Fort Wayne, Indiana has played host to all kinds of uh, massive baseball historical events and moments and figures and all that. Uh, and you guys took a little trek uh, to Fort Wayne, figuratively, for this week's interview. Yeah, last year, Sam and I took a literal trek to uh, Fort Wayne as part of our road trip to see the Field of Dreams game. And that was great to stop there, along with Kelsey Hennigan. And um, this was a metaphorical trek to Fort Wayne. And Tyler, like you said, Fort Wayne for a fairly small, comparatively small American city was home of, you know, the first professional baseball game ever played in 1871. We saw the site of that when we swung by last year. Um, allegedly, you know, disputedly, the first night game uh, ever played in baseball. And it was one of the prime areas for the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League, you know, as immortalized in League of Their Own. Uh, from 1945 to 1954, it was the home of the Fort Wayne Daisies. And Fort Wayne, through the years, and especially this coming Saturday, uh, have a lot of big plans to honor uh, the Fort Wayne Daisies and the AAGPBL in general. So we talked to Fort Wayne Vice President of Marketing, Michael Limmer, all about what they got planned for Saturday. And it's a, uh, it's a, it's a real journey of discovery, learning all this baseball history, and it was great to talk to him. Buying tickets to your favorite events shouldn't be stressful. Game time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater near you. With killer deals on last-minute tickets and their best price guarantee, you can stop stressing over the tickets and start getting hyped for the fun you'll have. Forget planning months in advance. Game Time has deals on tickets right up to the day of the event. Get exclusive flash deals on tickets for football, basketball, baseball, concerts, comedy, theater, and more. Buy tickets in a matter of seconds. Two taps and you're set. Plus, tickets are sent directly to your phone, so you never have to dig through your email and you'll be ready to check right in. So snag the tickets without the stress with GameTime. Download the GameTime app, create an account, and use code BASEBALL for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code BASEBALL for $20 off. Download GameTime today. Last-minute tickets, lowest price, guaranteed. This coming Saturday, Saturday, June 3rd, the Fort Wayne Tin Caps are going to be celebrating the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League and specifically the team from Fort Wayne, the Fort Wayne Daisies, who played from 1945 to 1954. The Tin Caps have uh, celebrated 
the daisies before, but they've got a huge multifaceted day scheduled for this Saturday, uh, multiple components, and uh, we want to learn more about it. So to that end, we have Michael Limmer, the Fort Wayne Tin Caps Vice President of Marketing. Thanks for being here. Happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me on. Yeah, and as I said, it's a, it's a multifaceted day. So uh, at the ballpark and otherwise. So let's start at the beginning. Uh, prior to that evening's game at Parkview Field, um, the team in collaboration with uh, Fort Wayne Parks and Recreation, uh, you're going to Memorial Park, which is where the Fort Wayne Daisies played, and you're unveiling mm-hmm. a monument that seems to have a lot of details, a lot going on. Uh, if you could tell us about what's going on on Saturday at Memorial Park. Yeah, Fort Wayne, uh, Indiana, just surprisingly in this the second largest city in Indiana has a lot of baseball history to it. We, we're the site of the very first professional baseball game back in 1871. Uh, we lay claim along with one other town as the first night baseball game under the lights. General Electric used to have a, a large plant here, so they always like to show off uh, their, their capacity and, and uh, the lighting there. And then also we were a site of one of the, the few All-American uh, Girls Professional Baseball League teams, like you said, the Fort Wayne Daisies. And they played, as a lot know, maybe from the, the movie A League of Their Own, they played when so many of the, the male baseball players were serving in World War II in the 40s and, and into the early 50s. And, you know, their Memorial Park is the site where they played uh, there was another site they played their first season, but Memorial Park was really their home uh, for the the last eight years that they were in Fort Wayne and played. And there had, it was always one of those things that we'd go over to the park, and there was a monument, a little a big stone that had etched into it, uh, home of the Fort Wayne Daisies, and it had the years there. And that was just nice to be able to 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 see that there and to know that that was marked. But as we've had the opportunity over the years to have former Daisies come and throw out a ceremonial first pitch and have them sign autographs for fans. And and I know myself having an 11 year old daughter right now and just how cool she thinks it was that she sees, um, you know, all these male professional baseball players since her dad works at the the tin caps. Um, the fact that she got to meet some of these, these ladies that are her grandma's age and say, yeah, I played professional baseball. That just was really inspiring to her. And to me as a dad, girl, dad, just just something that my daughter gets inspired about. I said, you know, what, what can we do more to really shine a spotlight, not only on the team, um, but on the individuals that were a part of that team. Because obviously any sort of team sport or any sort of entity, it's more than just the name on the Jersey. And so we worked in collaboration with the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League, and we got a comprehensive list of every, every former player that they had documentation of, uh, as well as the, the managers of the team, the chaperones, which were a really big part of the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League experience, and then a few of the kind of more official bat kids. I'm sure there were a lot of bat kids similar to the Tin Caps where – there's probably dozens every year, but some of the, the ones that had been uh, officially documented. And we said, how do we shine a spotlight on these individuals, the ones that kind of made this up, who were made up the, ten, the daisies? And uh, so we worked with Fort Wayne Park's direct department because Memorial Park is a city park. And I said, you know, we'd like to see if there's a way that we could add to what's already at Memorial Park and list every single name that we have documented from the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League uh, not-for-profit organization and say, can we get a, can, what would it cost for us to work with you to list every single name and have it as, you know, plaques that are up there. And they were great to work with. They're like, we would love this idea. We would love to do it. Um, you know, parks and rec and city budgets are always uh, not as much as you would like them to be. And so we said, well, what could we do? What could we do our part? And so they gave us a number to say, Hey, if you guys can can raise this amount, um, you know we'll do we'll do it. We'll do we'll meet we'll do all the prep work. We'll do all the, the landscaping around it. If you guys can can raise the funds for the monument, and so we did a jersey auction last year that raised uh, a majority of the funds as well as some individual donations. Uh, we worked with our media partners here locally to kind of spread the word, and then um, 
you know, so we were able to to move forward with the monument being created this past off season, and then the timing was perfect. And uh, with all the kind of delays to the project, it actually worked out that um, we can unveil it on the same day that we were hosting this year's Fort Wayne Daisies Night, and be able to have we're going to have two former Daisies players that are still with us and still they'll be at the, the unveiling, uh, as well as six former. Uh, player families that'll be out representing their grandma or mom um, at that that uh, monument unveiling. And then those folks will come to the game that night and we'll recognize them in front of the crowd uh, that night. We'll wear Daisy replica jerseys. We'll auction off those jerseys as well to make up a little bit of the gap of what we still needed to raise for the monument. And then we're starting to think about how we can highlight those individuals in a more permanent basis here at Parkview Field in Fort Wayne since we draw, you know, hundreds of thousands of, of baseball and, and uh, fans to the ballpark to be able to showcase those players, not only at Memorial Park when people go to visit uh, the site of the former, there's still a baseball field there now, um, but be able to highlight them here at the ballpark as well. So, you know, just really excited about, you know, thinking about some – Saturday afternoon, a family going over to Memorial Park and being able to see their mom, their grandma, their aunt's uh, name amongst all the other names of these Daisies players and just knowing that we were able to not only highlight the Daisies, but then also all these names of these women that, um, you know, played ball. It was, it's really awesome. Yeah, and as you get engage with fans on this, like how much is or were the Daisies part of like the tapestry of a long history of baseball in Fort Wayne and how much of this is educational. Like a lot of people hadn't heard about the daisies. It's been almost eight decades now since they played. I mean, yeah. you might know somebody who knows somebody, or you might've seen the movie, but like how much are people learning through you guys about what the daisies were? A, a lot. And that's good. It's also unfortunate. Uh, and part of the reason why we really wanted to do this, why I was, why our staff was motivated to do it is, I started as an intern in Fort Wayne in 1999 and there, there was a, uh, the, the front desk receptionist at the time when I started as an intern, um, she, she would tell me stories about how she, she was a grandma age at the time that I, I worked with her. Um, and she would tell me stories about how she was a junior Daisy and how she got to go do a baseball clinic with the Daisies back in the late forties, early fifties. And at that point we were, you know, 50 years removed. So she was probably in her early sixties at the time. So probably 11 or 12, um, you know, getting to interact with the Daisies. And then over time, and I would hear a lot of stories like that. Oh yeah. My mom was a, you know, junior Daisy or, um, you know, we'd have Daisy's nights and there there would be quite a few around that would be able to come out to the ballpark and whether it was Memorial Stadium back when we were the Wizards or now as the Tin Caps. And I just think over the last several years, especially post-COVID, um, just realizing there's not that many former players that are still with us. And I was hearing less and less stories about my mom did this or my great you know, great aunt did that. And I was really, and having an 11 year old daughter myself, like I mentioned, um, I was really, I'm, am, and still worried that that legacy and those stories were going to be lost. And that those individuals that made up that team were going to be, I don't want to say forgotten, because obviously their families, that's going to be part of some, a point of pride. But I just wanted to make sure our community realized that, oh, yeah, Fort Wayne Daisies. And then the first thing you say is, oh, a league of their own. And, oh, yeah, yeah, that I understand that concept. But it's like hey, these were members of our community. These were individuals, females that, you know, were ball players, And just making sure that the individual legacy was not lost. Um, and so many of those players are, are no longer with us. I think at last count of the 44 people, I think, that are on this plaque, from my understanding, uh, the last I talked with the, the, our contact from the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League, from their records, only six are still around that are, are, are still living. And so um, the fact that we are able to have, you know, two of those six here with us on Saturday and, and celebrate them and, 
last year when we did an autograph signing with them and then two other uh, players that didn't play for the Daisies but did play in the league and, and lived close by, we invited them in and just said, hey, you're you're part of the league. Whether you're Daisy or not, we want to celebrate you. Um, you know, their autograph line was longer <laughs> longer than some – sometimes when our players sign autographs, you know, after our Sunday games and just to see the pride on their face and the energy that they have uh, when they're interacting with these fans and, and with these players and they, some of them bring their own little baseball cards that they have, or uh, it's just really cool. And, you know, the fact that we're able to um, shine a spotlight on them, um, you know, they hold a place in our community's heart and, the fact that we're able to show them that and hopefully these other family members that represent um, former players, you know, just be able to show that we're, we're proud of them and excited that Fort Wayne had the daisies. And, and this is just a small token of appreciation, but we hope that it really makes an impact and we're able to educate another generation that, um, you know, that the daisies existed and, and why and the role that they played in that point in time of our nation's history, as well as should continue to today. Yeah. So the two uh, Fort Wayne Daisies uh, alumni who are going to be there, and I hope I'm getting these names right. Uh, Dolly Vanderlip Osborne, 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 Dolly Vanderlip yeah. Osborne and Katie Horstman. And yeah. uh, that's really cool thing that they'll be at the game on Saturday. Uh, what other elements of um, that night's ball game, you know, promotionally speaking, are you most looking forward to? Yeah, I, I think the thing that's always great, it, it, it almost brings a tear to my eye, you know, talking about it now is just remembering the impact of last year's event of, you know, we had the opportunity to, last year we had three former Daisies out. Um, and a, a 10 days after our event, one of the Daisies that was out at our game passed away. Um, and so just being able to know that we had the timing of that event in May so she could participate instead of a month later where she wouldn't have been able to was impactful. Uh, we got to highlight each of those players on the field before the game, interview them. Um, the, the two that you mentioned are just, they're everything that you would imagine a, a grandma that played professional baseball would be like uh, spunk, vim, vigor, whatever sort of, uh, of adjectives you want to use. And just the appreciation as we interviewed them and kind of gave them a spotlight pregame uh, that they were able to share. And they shared some stories about playing and, and the, love, the way they love Fort Wayne uh, was great. So that's going to be a highlight. We're going to have to give them the opportunity to do that again before the game on Saturday. Uh, the autographs is always just, it just warms my heart to be able to see that interchange of just uh, pride and and just the, the the little girls that are getting autographs. My daughter has a, one of the autographs that she got last year. Put it in a ball cube. It's in a place of honor, you know, in our house where she keeps the other things that she's her her dance medals and trophies and things like that. Um, and then it's always fun to kind of lean into a league of their own and the different things that are memorable from that movie. And we'll theme some of our on field promotions around that. Uh, the players wearing jerseys, we're auctioning those off, like I said, to raise funds that can kind of continue the education and and uh, celebration process as we continue to move forward. And, um, you know, one of the things that we kind of realized through this process, too, is that no one controlled the trademark for Fort Wayne Daisies. And so that's something as a team we were able to, to um, you know, apply for and get approved for. And so we feel like we're we're a ambassador as well as the caretaker for the Fort Wayne Daisy's name and legacy. And it's something that we really want to lean into and, and continue to do. So uh, just like you guys said before, the education part, the exposure uh, to people in our community about what the Daisies were, are, and should continue to be, that's always going to be my biggest uh, you know, point of pride when we do a night like this. Yeah, well, really looking forward to uh, you know seeing pictures and hearing more about the event. And uh, yeah, you know, if you're listening to this podcast uh, on Friday, June second, think about getting to Fort Wayne on uh, June third to see uh, their tribute to the Daisies. And um, Michael Limmer, Vice President of the Fort Wayne Tin Caps, thanks so much for uh, filling us in on this uh, great promotion you have planned. And um, as I said, it's it's a great thing, and we're looking forward to hearing more about it. 
My pleasure. And I just want to say to both of you, thank you for the spotlight that you shine on uh, minor league baseball communities all across the country. There's 120 of us and uh, the stories and the community impact that, that you guys share around the country inspires other teams and people like myself to say, how could we be making that impact in, in where we are? And I do encourage all the fans that are listening, whether they're industry folks or not, um, just to find ways that they can they can make an impact, be a part of, of their community and really celebrate the things that make them unique. That's, that's one of the fun things about minor league baseball. And I just really appreciate uh, you know, both of your efforts on, on shining a spotlight on those things uh, and encouraging people to be involved and to find ways that they can make an impact. So thank you for what you guys do. I appreciate it. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you. We, we appreciate that as well. And uh, we'll keep on doing it. Just keep on giving us material. <laughs> <laughs> and all the different food things you guys get to try. I mean, all the all the wacky stuff is uh, it, it's all a part of it. And, and uh, it's always fun to see what crazy things our counterparts are doing around the around the country and inspiring us to do even more way, wacky things in the future. Yeah. Well, we'll, yeah, we'll keep doing it. And um, yeah, the reality of podcasting in an office, our uh, time in this conference room is up and there's people waiting. <laughs> <to do it. laughs> Getting kicked out. Yep. It was great talking to you. And uh, yeah, thanks again, Michael. It was great talking to you. Yep. My pleasure. Anytime. <laughs> Take care, guys. Have Bye. everyone. I'm always counting down to when I can finally upgrade my phone. With some carriers, you have to wait ages. Like if you're with Verizon, it could take you up to three years before you're ready to upgrade. But you can break free with T-Mobile. They just introduced their new Go 5G Plus plan, the first ever plan with new and two, where new and existing customers always get the same great device deals and are upgrade ready every two years. Head to your neighborhood store or T-Mobile.com to find out more. Very cool learning all that stuff about uh, Fort Wayne and Fort Wayne's baseball history. And um, with that, we're going to talk some on-field stuff as we move deeper and deeper into the first half of the minor league baseball season coming up really on the final few weeks of the first half of the minor league baseball season. And this was really like uh promotion slash movement week across the minor leagues. We had big names uh, making the jump up from various levels to their next stages of their pro careers. Uh, but there is one prospect whose headlines sort of stand out above them all. And that's a guy who's making the first step of his professional career. And that is San Diego Padres prospect, Ethan Saus, a catching prospect who was signed for $5.6 million out of Venezuela in January. Uh, the highest bonus given to a player in this year's international free agent class. And Ethan Salas at 16 years old made his debut in the California League, uh, we're recording this on Wednesday, so it was last night, his pro debut uh, with Lake Elsinore. And in that game, doubled, singled, walked in his three trips to the plate. Uh, really impressive. He does not turn 17 until tomorrow. Uh, so by the time you're hearing this, happy birthday to Ethan Salas. Um, but man, a 2006 birthday already in the minor leagues, uh, and not just in the minor leagues, but a guy who the Padres feel can can move pretty quickly. Uh, they have already suggested that there is the potential that he could be in the big leagues as a teenager, which would make him the first teenage catcher in the major league since Pudge Rodriguez in 1991, uh, according to the athletic, um, Sam, there are impressive debuts being 16 and playing already, uh, at the low a level is something entirely different. Yeah, no. And, and this was something that, you know, talking to some Padres people this spring, they were enamored by Ethan Salas since signing. I mean, you don't give him $5.6 million. Their, their international signing pool was like a little north of 5.8. Like they just did not have money to give anybody else because they gave so much of it to Ethan Salas. But that's because they're such a believer in the player. Uh, he has a really sweet left-handed swing, obviously, as you said, Tyler, got to show that off in his debut, picking up two hits, including a double in his first at-bat that I think came at the end of an eight-pitch at-bat. Like, he was seeing lots of pitches and still was able to double the other way going to left field. Um, and But the thing that st stands out to me most, and this is what I was hearing most from San Diego people this spring, was how good his defense is. Catching is a very difficult position. I would say it's the most difficult position on the field. Like One there's of the most reason. difficult positions in sports entirely. 
Yeah, because you have to do like five different jobs. It's it's insane. You have to learn your pitching staff. You have to learn how to coach or uh, call games, especially at the pro level. You have to learn the other team's bats to know when to call what whatever. You still have to hit yourself. Like this is not something where it's just like, all right, well, you're going to only do the, the pitching side. Uh, you have to learn how to catch. You have to learn how to throw. You have to still be a productive hitter so that they can keep you in the lineup. So throwing Ethan Solace at 16 years old into that deep end of California league catching is incredible. And he was dealing with some right shoulder soreness um, earlier this spring that may have held him back. Otherwise, maybe he would have been with the storm even earlier. Um, I thought, you know, we're looking at the beginning of short season ball, which is now just complex league ball. Uh, That's starting on June 5th. So that's coming right around the corner. I thought he was going to open up in the Arizona complex league and potentially be with Lake Elsinore maybe by the end of June, but the Padres have decided, listen, we're going to start him this early. Uh, you know, he, he caught major leaguers in the spring. Uh, I saw some video of him catching you Darvish and you Darvish looking very pleased with how it went. I mean, his framing is right on point. It looks like butter back there. He's very smooth in all his movements. Uh, and that's a big reason why they thought they could get aggressive with him. I mean, it, I can't highlight enough how rare it is for somebody to just skip over not only the Dominican Dominican Summer League, but the Arizona Complex League, the Florida Complex League, whatever, and start at single A months after signing. I mean, I think the last time we saw this, the last time I can remember it being this big of a deal anyway, was Julio Arias. And it speaks to like what minor league coverage was at the time, because I remember that day and just getting like the transactions in the morning and just being like, this 16 year old is starting yeah. for Great Lakes. What what is happening? Who, who is this? What is it? Who is this guy? And now we know Julio Arias, a really good major league pitcher. Um, who knows what's going to happen with Ethan Salas? Salas again, lots can happen between now and the time he makes San Diego. But the fact that he's on this trajectory is really, really promising and reflective of who he is in the player and who the Padres believe he can be as a player. So who knows what what's going to happen this summer? Like, again, I think the, the swing is going to translate really well. I think there's some budding power in there. Uh, would not be surprised to see him be just like a league average bat. But being doing that at the age of like a high school junior is insanely cool. And uh, I can't wait to see what's to come of him and where he is going to end up. Like, I don't know. I, I'm not going to predict anybody's going to make the major leagues as a teenage catcher. But if there was anybody to ever do it, it seems like it's going to be Ethan Salas. Pretty cool stuff. Um, A lot of other guys making the jump uh, to double A. We've got James Wood, who is now with the Harrisburg Senators uh, in the double A Eastern League in the Washington Nationals organization. Marcelo Mayer making the next step uh, in the Boston Red Sox system. He's with double A Portland now. Uh, Junior Caminero in the Tampa Bay Rays system is now with double A Montgomery. Uh, What stands out about each of these, Sam? Yeah, so Marcelo Mayer is like our top ranked prospect of that group. He's number five overall right now on MLB.com's top 100. Um, but, you know, fourth overall pick in 2021, he was part of that really loaded shortstop class. So it's been interesting to see Jordan Lawler get double A time last year while, while Meyer opened up this year at high A uh, Greenville. But he certainly performed really well there. Um, hit 290 with an 890 OPS in 35 games. He spent some time at high A Greenville last year too. The, the big re- thing on Meyer and a reason why we have him as a top five prospect is he has a plus hit tool from the left side. He has at least above average power and he can really stick at shortstop. I think he can be a plus defender. He has the arm for it. You look at some of these other guys who are at short. It's a question of like, are they going to move to second? Are they going to move to third? Uh, Jordan Lawler, I think is also a pretty good shortstop, but he's not up to Meyer's, uh, capabilities there so that's a big reason why he's a top five overall guy and if he's going to hit like he has so far that's all-star quality uh so really interested to see how he's going to make that jump because as we have long said tyler high a to double a is the highest jump in the Myers. it's the biggest jump in the Myers. like you're going to start seeing guys who actually have major league experience at double a uh and when you're 20 years old as marcello is and he's going to be 20 through this entire season. He's not turning 21 until December. It's going to be a real challenge, and I'm, I'm really fascinated to see how he handles it. Uh, James Wood also making that jump uh, to double-A. James Wood was the biggest prospect piece that the uh, Nationals picked up from the Padres in last year's Juan Soto blockbuster deal. 
Um, obviously, C.J. Abrams and Mackenzie Gore are big pieces on their own, but they had actually graduated by that point. He's also 20 years old. Just one of my favorite prospects in the game right now because he's six foot six, has the power of a six foot six guy, but also glides really well on the base paths. Um, has those really long strides like we've talked about with Ellie De La Cruz. Doesn't always look like he's running hard, but the times are really good. He can play a center field. He can play right. Now he's bumping up against Robert Hassel the third. So uh, it'd be interested to see how Harrisburg makes those two work, if they're going to alternate them between center and right, if Wood is going to be in right and Hassel is going to be in center. That's what it was in their first game together, and I'll be interested to see how that continues to work itself out. But James Wood, these big guys with big levers, we usually talk about them in terms of struggling with a hit tool. Can they cover such a big strike zone? James Wood has. I mean, he's he has – Really good swing decisions for the most part. He walks more than you would expect. He's willing to uh, take deep counts uh, and be advanced in that way. Yes, he struck out 51 times in 44 games, but I think that's a result of getting so deep into the count and then hitting the ball hard. I mean, that even when he strikes out, it's done with intent. He's trying to put the ball in play at a hard rate that's going to allow him to pick up the doubles and triples and home runs that are such a big part of his profile. So again, what happens to that approach that it can be passive at times, uh, but is all in terms of trying to hunt for his pitch. How is that going to translate to double A? We're going to be fascinated to see how that goes, because if he handles that, then I don't, I'm not saying James Wood is going to be on the level of like a Jackson Holiday or Ellie De La Cruz by the time we do our next update. But he could be a top five prospect, you know, by midseason if he handles double A, as we hope and kind of expect. And Junior Caminero. I won't call him a, a breakout prospect because we were thinking about him as a potential top 100 guy coming into the year, but he's the prime example of like why you should never trade with a raise, right? Like the guardians traded junior Caminero when he was in the DSL or coming off the DSL for Tobias Myers in just kind of like a 40 man deal. Like we need to make room on the 40 man who wants this guy who's on the edge of our 40 man and we'll take a DSL flyer. And they've turned Junior Caminero into a guy with a plus hit tool with at least plus power. Uh, some questions about where he's going to land defensively, but the guy hit 356 with a 1094 OPS in 36 games at high A. And he, like these other guys, he's 19. He's turning 20 on July 5th, uh, but now he's at double A at just 19 years old. I mean, he's like on a similar trajectory at this point to Jackson Churio, who was our number two overall prospect. So, it's a bat that's going to play everywhere. It's tremendous bat speed. He translates it into power really well. Would not be surprised if he overtakes Curtis Mead as like the top hitter in the Ray system uh, by the end of the year or even midseason with the bay, with the way everything's translated so far. So really interesting to see all these guys move up at the same time. I wonder how much of that has to deal with short season starting next week. Like you need to give the rosters a little bit of a shake. You need to send some guys maybe off the complex like an Ethan Solace, and then that forces other guys up the ladder. But in all three of these cases, Meyer, Wood, Caminero, they certainly earned the chance to move when they have. Uh, and now, you know, being two steps away, now's the time when you start thinking, okay, when are these guys going to be major league ready? I'm not saying it's going to be a month. I'm certainly not saying it's going to be this summer, but double A is when you start to dream. And, and these guys have a lot to dream about. A lot of good stuff. This is a fun time of the year in that even when it seems like, oh, yeah, things have mostly settled into the rhythm of the season. This is when you do start seeing a lot of that movement, and that'll kind of tick up uh, as the month of June goes along as well. And then usually quiets down somewhat in July, and then we see some later season movement too. So keep an eye on your favorite prospects as they could be making the charge uh, up to the next level in your favorite organization. Um, with that, we'll step aside. Getting set to wrap this thing up. Josh Jackson swings through and uh, back to say goodbye on the other side. Start your electric journey right here, right now. With a Volvo XC90 Recharge, our plug-in hybrid SUV with extended range. For more everyday electric journeys on a single charge, with a hybrid option for longer adventures. Contact your local retailer to book a test drive, or design your own vehicle at volvocars.com slash US. The Volvo XC90 Recharge Plug-in Hybrid. The electric car with a backup plan. 
Legend has it that if you go out to your local ball field on a moonlit night, you just may see ghosts of the miners. But you won't be hearing it this week or next. Ghosts of the Miners will return to the show before the show before you know it. But for now, sit tight. Josh Jackson, a uh, little bit of an early summer, late spring hiatus from Ghosts of the Miners for a good pal, Josh. But uh, we will certainly... Uh, be hearing from Josh and be hearing some more stories of some of the most fascinating and short run teams in minor league baseball history coming up uh, here over the next few weeks. And that brings us to our final segment on this week's episode of the show before the show, where we tell you what to be watching on MILB.TV, as well as a promotion for the week slash weekend uh, that Ben is keeping an eye on. Ben, fire away. Yeah, well, we're entering uh, prime time for minor league baseball promotions. I would say really prime time doesn't start till the later half of this month, but lots to choose from right now. I was looking at my list and I was like, ah, the Lehigh Valley Iron Pigs are playing as the Hoagies on Salute to Philly night. And uh, Akron Rubber Ducks are doing all out 90s with a Karen Parsons appearance and bobblehead. And Karen Parsons played Hillary on uh, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. But then I was looking at my list and I said, I want to go with one a little bit more under, under the radar. And I believe they've done this before, but the Beloit Skycarp are doing Nancy Faust night, and they will have Nancy Faust in the ballpark. And Nancy Faust, for those who don't know, was an organist for the Chicago White Sox at Old Comiskey Park for decades and was a real big part of the spirit and energy of that team, you know, especially back in, you know, the, going back to the Bill Vec days and, you know, a lot of the, the 70s era White Sox and uh, her organ playing and, um, you know, reacting in real time and playing relevant songs, the events on the field and just her dexterity in general, you know, was a huge part. And she's one of the more legendary organists in the game. And I believe how this came about is that Quint Studer, the owner of the Pensacola Blue Wahoos and Beloit Skycarp um, has Midwest roots and, uh, you know, was a fan of Nancy's going back decades. And so he just put out the invite to her first to play in Pensacola. And actually I think the team surprised him knowing that he loved Nancy Faust playing the organ. They surprised him by bringing her out to play a game in Pensacola. And now it's becoming a thing. Uh, during this is Saturday, June third in Beloit. The Sky Carp, their in-game audio will just be Nancy Faust all night. And I just think that's awesome. A you know an iconic baseball organist uh, making the trip to the Beloit uh, just to give that throwback organ atmosphere. And um, you know, on a personal level, I understand that minor league baseball games and major league baseball games, you know, the teams want to make them a party. There's music nonstop, but the older I get, the more I have that old man reaction. I'm just like, it's too loud or just like stop between pitches. Now just stop. It's okay. Chill out. So anything to kind of interrupt that, uh, that mentality and just hear some organ music throughout the course of a, what I hope would be a pleasant Saturday evening, yeah, it just sounds great to me. Nancy Faust Knight, Blue Sky Carp. It's also just very cool to have the stories of people like that told. And I feel like we're in an era where teams are seeking out and telling a lot of those stories on a lot more regular basis. And I find that very, very cool. Um, all right. What are you watching, Sam? What do you got coming up? Yeah. So we just talked about Ethan Solace in the last segment. Uh, Lake Elsinore games on are on MILB.TV. I mean, we got to see his debut in which he went two for three with a double and a walk. Uh, which was very awesome that we could see him that quickly to see how well the bat played. Uh, so tune in at any game. Honestly, just check the Lake Elsinore lineup uh, the beginning of every day, see if he's playing. I think they're going to probably ease him in a little bit between catching. He DH'd in his first start. Uh, he is only 16 years old. I don't think they're going to give him a massive workload, but they didn't send him there not to play. Uh, so whether you're listening on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, just know all of those games over the weekend will be broadcast on Mill TV. Saturday will be the free game of the day. Uh, if you don't have a Mill TV subscription or an MLB TV subscription, doesn't matter. Go to MLB.com slash pipeline. We'll be streaming there the game there for free. If you do have subscriptions to at bat or Mill TV, tune in whenever you want. Catch you some Ethan Solace because he's about to become a massive name uh, across minor league baseball. Tyler, what are you watching? 
Uh, we have discussed Jackson Holiday from time to time, the third ring prospect in baseball uh, these days and the top prospect in the Baltimore Orioles organization. Uh, Holiday spent his first 14 games of the season uh, with Delmarva and just destroyed uh, with the Shorebirds. So after posting a 396 average and an 1182 OPS in 14 games, he's up at Aberdeen, uh, the next step up in the A ball ranks. And there he's batting 370 with an 1122 OPS. So he's still. Uh, very, very good. Jackson Holiday and uh, Aberdeen will be on the road at Hudson Valley this week, and you can catch those games at MILB.TV if you want to check out one of the next biggest talents in minor league. I can't even really say next. He's already there. Uh, but a guy who's probably going to be a top overall prospect at some point fairly soon. So all of that coming up around the world of minor league baseball this week. And uh, for Benjamin Hill, Sam Dykstra, Josh Jackson, and everyone else, my name is Tyler Mon, and we'll catch you next week on the show before the show. 